Thank you so much, everybody, for making it here today. Uh, grateful we're already at 85. I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, I know that many of us were isolated last week, and so hopefully folks' spirits are high and ready for another exciting uh, work week here. Um, so let me begin uh, next. So as a reminder, we have an intranet portal, right? This is really the one-stop shop for accessing all PSA stuff. This is, you can see on the left of the screen, I don't think you can see my, yeah, you won't be able to see my uh, mouse. Uh, um, on the left of the screen, you can see here um, the different um, uh, ways that you can navigate through our intranet portal. Right, and so you can see that we have um, all of our different types of protocols, our contact informations, our annual meetings. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a dive on some of those subject headings, but I really, if you have not been to our intranet portal, you're doing yourself a disservice. This is really a well-developed product. Uh, I think that we have a lot of great content up there and you'll find a lot of ways to access what we do and how we do things in here. So please navigate, next. So if you clicked on that center uh, tab, you would see that it takes you to this contact information. Here under contact information, you can see um, that we are listing our PSA directors and core team leads. Next, you can figure out who our support staff are, what their roles are, and get their contact information. Next, you can find out who are the leads of different types of projects or um, expertise councils um, across our uh, our whole team. So please, if you're not familiar with these different team leads already, you, you're going to probably be familiar with the folks that you're interacting with closely. If you have any questions, this is where you can find those personnel. All right, next. And here you can see a, a link to our, our protocols. And also in the top right corner, do you see tech dashboard and PSA resources and the email list? Is there, am I, Sarah, am I able to generate uh, um, a, a pointer? Yes, I can see your mouse as you speak. You, you can see my mouse? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, so uh, you can see here these resources in the top right corner of the screen. Uh, and so the tech dashboard, for example, they'll be talking about it later today, but, but these are just great resources for you and this team. Um, and then again, all the different types of projects that we're involved with, you can get details about. Next. So that's actually my cursor that you're seeing, Sarah. I'm not sure if there's a way for me to enable you to put your cursor on. Yeah, I didn't think there was. I was just making sure. Oh, yeah. Sorry about the misunderstanding. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. So, um, and then here is just me clicking on one of those links, taking you to the on-farm protocols and data collection. And look at the... the the level of detail and organization around our different data collection. So if you have any questions or confusions about this team and the projects and what we're doing, there is a very good chance that it's up on this website and you can watch a video. One of the things that we've been really motivated around in this network, and this is a feature that we've seen other groups do historically, and we just felt that that this is a really powerful way to organize a team that's this large, is that we need to generate video content on all of the different things that we do. Anywhere from how to use a water sensor, to installing a litter bag, to um, some of the ways that we use our different statistical packages and our Kobo forms. So they've been very well done. There's a great team that's working on these different efforts. So if you haven't seen any of our videos, please check them out as well as you could go to our our, our link for our, all of our YouTube videos. Next. All right, so I'm gonna break apart the elements of our team in real quick couple of slides, and then I'm gonna try to put it together in an architectural view so it's clear how we put these parts together and what their roles are. So as many of you know, we are on station and on farm research, you know, first and foremost, right? That's we are coordinated research networks, we are committed to breaking down data silos and, and not having all of our data, you know, island away from each other, right? You know, and, and so this is all part of bringing together, you know, information around climate and soil and management and being able to say something conclusive. Last night, I was reading one of my graduate students' uh, manuscripts. And in that paper, 
it, it reads like so many papers, right? Uh, well, 2018 was the wettest year on recorded history. And 2019 was you know, very atypical to the weather patterns in this region. And so we were not able to draw conclusions between these treatments because in these two years, we had these different weather patterns, right? And so we're all used to that storyline. And so this is how we're trying to break that cycle is bringing our data together and making it machine readable, building standards around that data so that we can all coordinate um, the solutions and build these insights together. So on the bottom left corner is just a, 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 a is not a common experiment that we are involved in just yet. It's just a visual of a common experiment. And, and the green circles represent these research stations that are doing common experiments. And then these other images are just images of, of sites that we've done on farm research already. Next. And here we're just emphasizing that we are very motivated around integrating technology into our team. And it's not technology for technology's sake. These technology solutions and the data flow and pipelines that we are building and the real-time visualizations and analysis of this data, this is to really facilitate building insights, coordinate networks, create standards, and improve our ability to define relationships. So it's, it's really critical to develop these technologies. And you're gonna hear a lot about how we develop technologies, our philosophy, how it rolls out to a team, how we're trying to make sure that no one is working with technologies that's creating a lot of frustration for any one individual. Next. Uh, and obviously the, the, the central core to our team beyond kind of uh, the, the research on station is linking us all up around the country around these on-farm experiments, as I've mentioned. And, and here is just some you know, information about the kinds of things we're doing on-farm, right? So we're looking at climate, soil management interactions, in cover crops without cover crops. We're doing this in corn, soybeans, and cotton. We're looking across a whole suite of different metrics like insects and disease and slugs, water, nitrogen, and weeds. We're developing these real-time data flows and we're building that infrastructure to support that. Okay, next. Here's just a visual of the farms. Let's keep going. So, um, this is a, a, a slide and just ignore the red text actually, the red text in here, I accidentally forgot to delete that. That's for another presentation I was giving to convey this concept of developers and data and users of AI. But, but just look at the phases one through three here. Phase one is what we call an early protocol and tech development. And that is where we have simplified management methods um, and, and protocols that we are still revising and have not really, um, matured past the point where we're not making adjustments to it. So think of like the common experiments is much like that, right? These common experiments are being developed. They're, they're not, um, they have not been implemented before. We're going into our first year. They need a lot of kind of um, trial and error. We, have, we haven't even gone out to the field yet to find out that, oh, we thought we were gonna sample this or we thought it was gonna be like this and now we gotta make a change to our data sheets. So if we're gonna be making changes to our, our data entry, if we're going to be able to change some of our data collection over the course of the years, that's not a mature protocol. That's phase one. That's And we use technologies like Google Sheets to support that, right? So Google Sheets is a software we're using for our data storage because it's nimble and we can make adjustments uh, more on the fly than we can in a mature protocol like phase two, where we're using you know, web-based applications to do that, right? So this is now where we're automating that data acquisition and the aggregation into a database. And that you'll see most of the on-farm protocols are at that point now, right? So if you're on-farm, you're using automated workflows. Some of our protocols in our common experiments, like the litter bag in common experiment one, is going to be a mature protocol that will interface with phase two type approach. And where we're going with all of this is obviously this phase three, which is that we can automate not only the data uh, acquisition and, and aggregation, but the analysis and the visualization of that data, both for growers, both for our, our researchers um, and our other partners. Next slide. Um, and so then we also have what we like to uh, convey as a technology uh, life cycle. So I've mentioned the protocol life cycle, and now we're looking at a technology life cycle. And so 
Um, here we see alpha, beta, and all users. Um, so in this, this when we are, and you can see across here, um, all the, these different types of data streams coming in are feeding into a database, right? So whether it's these web apps or it's our soil water and moisture temperature sensors, our yield monitors, all of these different types of uh, data streams are feeding into uh, databases. And we have different types of technology that facilitate that. When we are developing a technology to, to, to get it to the point where it's actually working, we call that the alpha stage, right? So at that R&D stage where we are working on developing uh, a technology and, and, and testing it out, that is our alpha phase. No, that is happening amongst a small number of users. Primarily, that's only been happening at like NC State, uh, Beltsville in Maryland, uh, Texas A&M, uh, the Noble Research Institute, a couple of our key players that have been doing these kinds of tech development. Then when something matures enough where we're like, okay, this is really working pretty well, um, we want to start to see how this works out for other users. We find other kind of advanced tech users, folks who have a lot of experience with different technology, uh, but not experience working with this technology per se. And then we go a year with those folks beta testing that technology. And that's where we kind of scale up, you know, from going from one to three sites where we were doing alpha, anywhere up to five to 10 sites at the beta stage. Once we get through beta stage, we're releasing this to all users. And that's when this becomes a public uh, tool. And this actually, the same workflow is not just happening um, for our technologies. It's also happening at, for our decision support tools. Next. Um, here is, um, uh, a schematic that I presented a number of times, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. This is just to illustrate the point that we are very focused around our end goals of building decision support tools, which is integrating our data, our models, and our user interface. And um, these tools could be expert opinion, empirical, process-based models, machine learning, and model hybrids. Um, and we're serving kind of researchers, as you can imagine, for those on this network and beyond. Um, and then the typical technology transfer pathways to farmers uh, and trying to put this in the hands of, of policymakers to help inform their decision making like NRCS. Next. Okay, so this is um, a visual that um, I think Ankita made the first crack at this. Uh, well, we, we had an earlier version, which we called our information ecology schematic. And then this has been kind of modified to show kind of the the um, pipeline of our data flow, you know, and, and, and I'm going to use this to illustrate the kind of the architecture of our team and how we're structured. Okay, so this is a good way to see how the, you know, as, as you enter the network here um, as a partner, um, you are part of that early stages where we're trying to use existing data or new data from the on-farm research, right? So the reason that both of those arrows are going into our permissionable databases is that we are going to be aggregating historical data as well as generating new data, feeding that into our databases. Those databases are informing our models and our tools, and that then is used by our networks for extension, education, and outreach. So what I'm gonna do is use this visual schematic and break it apart slowly to give a more clear uh, um, distinction of the parts and how they connect. So let's uh, advance this slide. So this is gonna be a busy slide, so just bear with me. Um, hopefully you'll tell me at the end of this whether you hate it or not. I just made this in the last couple of days. We're not, we're not sure if this is just terrible or if this is useful. Okay, so the, here up in the far left corner, you can see the focus, you know, and you can see the blue side is inputs and the right side is outcomes. Inputs is, is, a, is, a, is, is probably the, the crudest way to describe what's on the left, but that's what we did. Um, so, you know, here we're breaking down data silos by building a coordinated on-farm and on-station research network. It's not that this hasn't been done before. Certainly folks have done that and we're uh, using uh, really good success stories as, as, as role models, just like we've learned a lot from the, the uh, corn cap project that was funded years ago that we've gleaned a lot from their organization. Um, but, but it is not the norm, right? I mean, we're mostly all islands working, you know, on our projects, maybe with one or two other locations. And so what we are trying to do here is decisively different. And so a lot of the infrastructure and workflows we put in place are to address this completely different way of doing science, which is having the public sector organized around 
you know, an initiative. So, you know, we're really focused on these cutter crop based corn, soybean, and cotton production systems. Um, and the management we're targeting, you know, most of this is cover crop based, reduced tillage systems, you know, nutrient water managed, pest management, and precision agriculture. Those are kinds of the themes that, you know, that we're touching as far as farmers and science. Uh, and you can see some of the partners listed here below. Uh, okay, next. And so all of that group is working to collectively to both, uh, we will be aggregating historical data. So you're going to be hearing from us soon about pulling to some historical data around cover crops and management and biomass and such. Um, and we've already started that process all actually already. Uh, but then we are also collecting lots of new data, right? And that's in the form of destructive samples and sensing data collection, right? And so we've got, you know, yields and plant and soil samples and pests and such. And, and we have, you know, uh, environmental uh, measurements that we're taking. Uh, and then the sensing data that's either remote, like satellite imagery, um, or it's you know, equipment mounted sensors, like the forage sensor box, or that'll be handheld. And then in field deployed sensors, like the water sensor box. Okay, okay next. So all of that goes into um, um, our structured databases and our, our spreadsheets and becomes part of our overall uh, data embedded within our cyber infrastructure. And a lot of that is facilitated by the kinds of community of practice that we're creating. So I lump these two together because I think that it makes sense here. This is both our cyber infrastructure and our community of practice. So community of, of practice will be around creating like data standards or we're sharing documentation of, of, of our models and our tools and our analysis, right? Um, we're, we're creating, um, uh, geospatial platforms and AI machine learning algorithms. And this is all supported on various different cyber infrastructure, like the different structured databases that we're creating um, or our tech dashboards. So all of that is kind of the glue that connects our teams together from both the data and the practice. Okay, next. So that then feeds into our models and our tools. And those models and tools, as I mentioned, are empirical based process-based models, hybrid approaches with machine learning, and all of that feeds into built insights, right? And those insights come in many forms, but it, 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 most importantly, in conceptually, it is linking up our climate, our soil, and our management across spatial scales to be able to understand how cover crops are driving dynamics you know, on farms, right? And on our research stations. And so it allows us to build a lot of these what if questions, like where we want to go as researchers, you know, if we're improving adoption of cover crops or their performance, how does that affect, you know, nutrient loading in the Chesapeake Bay? Uh, but it also allows us to do a lot of other things. So let's click uh, next. So here are some of the key things that we see that our models and tools and insights are offering, right? So first and foremost, it goes right into these farmers for solutions, right? Both in aiding them in decision-making, helping them in this co-learning process as we develop data and analysis on their farms, they're learning about solutions on their farm, but we're also building tools to help them with their decision-making and to inform precision technologies, right? A key output of PSA is that we want um, farmers to be using sustainable strategies like cover crops in a more precise way. That means site-specific management, right? That's the big part of this. So, so we know that cover crops vary across a, a, vary a lot across the landscape. You can have high performance areas, low performance areas. We want to put this highly variable ecological and biological strategies that we know are are, are often variable and put them into a precision framework so that when our farmers are out there making decisions about their crop populations, about their fertilizer inputs, and they're using variable rate technology, that cover crops are part of the, informing those variable rates. Uh, and then we have extension and education, and most of you can imagine all of the different pathways there. Um, I've listed some of them. I mean, then we are also connecting to consumers, right? So we are connecting to, um, through Dagan and Indigo Ag and the Ecosystem Service Marketplace, we are connecting to these different marketplaces that are generating from carbon and ecosystem service marketplaces that are allowing consumer companies to value products, right? So what is the carbon footprint 
of your saran wrap that you bought from Walmart, right? That kind of a thing, right? And so we are helping to build um, um, the data sets that are informing the models that these organizations are using. And you'll be hearing a little bit about some of these collaborators uh, later uh, during this two-day workshop. Uh, lastly, I'd like to just introduce a concept that we don't talk about enough, but it's a key goal of ours, which is if, when you think about that alpha and beta and, and user um, uh, technology pipeline that I talked about earlier, once a protocol becomes mature we, and it becomes so light and tight, you know, so some of our protocols that are going out to all users are not fully as light and tight as we want them to be. But once something gets so to the point that it's so light and tight, it can become a citizen science approach. This is something that then we can hand, put in the hands of far, you know, field technical staff from NRCS or county agents or, or, or farmers themselves who are deploying these technologies and that data then is feeding back into building, you know, models and insights and, and, and so on. So. I hope this was a useful way of conveying the structure of the team. Um, and then once we put the social science team element to this, Jen, I hope you like what I did here. I highlighted all of the boundaries of all of these components in orange. They're, that's the social science team, right? They're happening across every aspect of this team, right? So there, so, so if you go back to the last slide, go back to the last slide, and you go forward, you see how they're they're connected to everything, right? They're not just looking at the barriers to adoption uh, of of cover crops and these and these typical kinds of questions that we've seen uh, historically done in the in in, in adoption of, of new conservation strategies. But they're also looking at all of the different aspects of our team and how we function and how we're structured. And is our theory of change really uh, a viable and um, and, and an effective way of accelerating technology transfer. So we're just really excited that we've really built out a collaboration with the social science team that they're embedded in all aspects of what we do. Okay. Um, I think, uh, let's uh, skip this slide. Um, and um, let's uh, skip this slide because I think that I've gone a little bit long. So I'm just gonna skip this slide too. Skip this slide because I gave some of these slides in June. Skip this one, okay. So here's where I'm gonna start, right? So in our PSA network, as you know, we are developing lots of models and we are developing decision tools. And I'm just trying to show that workflow, right? So we have, you know, cover crop decomp models and nutrient release models. We have, uh, some of these are process-based, some empirical, as I mentioned earlier. We have um, this uh, whole field um, calculator, DNDC, that's looking at greenhouse gases and carbon flows. We're developing water models. All of these models, um, when you build an interface on these are becoming tools. And some of these tools we're targeting are tools to inform where folks take samples for their cover crop biomass, um, adaptive nitrogen water calculators, um, species selection economic and seeding rate calculators. Many of these tools are already built. They're already happening at some regional scale and have interfaces and we're just nationalizing them or in some cases we are building a new tool, right? In case of the water tool, we are building a new tool. So, so but, but most of these tools are fairly mature and we are, we are expanding their inference domain. Um, let's um, click next. And so part of that is, you know, using our existing data and historical data and data from our on farms and common experiments through destructive samples and sensing technology. But click, click. But to make these tools adaptive, um, we build, we need them to have information around climate and soil, right? We want these tools to have the adaptability um, to respond to climate and soil in their recommendation systems, right? And so we've, we're building APIs on soil and weather to do that. So let me give you a quick example of that. Uh, next. So here is an API that we've modified from um, the uh, Sergo APIs that are available to um, access into our tools and um, our different models, um, our taxonomic information, texture class, percent silt, sand, you know, clay, um, soil physical variables, landscape features, um, and land use features. So all of that now is built into an uh, easy to use wrap around their Sergo API to serve our tools. Click. Next. 
uh, as well as uh, weather data. So um, for those of you who have looked into this in the past, you may be aware that there's actually not really good publicly available weather APIs to aggregate weather data. It's really quite uh, shocking. For years, we thought, oh, this product exists and we'll just find it. And, and that'll be what we'll be using with our you know, nitrogen release models, for example. And, uh, but it turns out that it doesn't. And so we spent about a year and a half building a weather API to aggregate all of this uh, gridded weather data to feed into our tools. And so now this is a public API that is available for all folks who are building decision support tools to use to inform this. The private sector has been very effective at this, right? So they have tools that have this kind of you know, real time um, adaptability function, uh, but it's not been really readily available in the public sector. So we're glad that we can offer that both as, a, as PSA offerings, but also for the public to be able to embed into their own tools.